because there are female pedophiles too, they target a kid who comes from a broken family or a family with drug abuse or alcohol abuse in it, a kid whose parents work all the time and he's left alone or she's left alone. So, you know, they, we are beginning as a society to understand that, A, this happens more often than we want to understand or want to think. And number two, that there's a real psychological manipulation going on here of not only the parents and the children, but all of us into thinking, oh, he's just a nice guy. Oh, she's just a nice lady. Y- you know, I'll tell you, I, I look back and I think of all the opportunities there could have been for the media to say, and I'm thinking in the 90s and the 2000s, hey, who are all those kids traveling with Michael Jackson? Why are they all dressed like Michael Jackson? Yeah. Why are they always boys? Where are their parents? And the media didn't do that. The media just lapped up the the spin, you know, hey, he's going to buy the elephant man bones or mm-hmm. hey, you know, he sleeps in a hyperbaric chamber. He's got a he's got a chimpanzee named Bubbles. And we never bothered to ask the other questions. Yeah, I'm, I I'm kind of ashamed of my of my colleagues and myself for not waking up to this sooner. Yeah, the same thing goes with Epstein. You know, everybody's talking about this in 2015. But, uh, but I always go back to that Oprah Winfrey uh, interview with Michael Jackson where they're in the movie theater, and he's trying to explain away why there's a children's bed in the middle of the movie theater. Yeah. <laughs> yeah? It, was, it was for sick children, yeah. he said. Uh, yeah. The minute I saw that, I'm saying, what? <laughs> you know, are you kidding me? <laughs> it's impossible. Oh my God. You know what I remember about that interview, Ed? Yeah. I remember Oprah Winfrey, they're sitting at Neverland, and she starts asking him about girlfriends. <laughs> oh, come on, you got to have a girlfriend. And all the lights went out. Do you remember that? No, I don't remember It's like it, no. somebody just pulled a breaker or something, and all the lights went out. And you hear Oprah say something like, well, it's live television. Um, hmm, we'll be right back. And then when they come back from the commercial break, the lights are on, and she never gets back to the girlfriend question because who walks out the back of the room? Elizabeth Taylor. Oh, really? And subject, subject just gets changed entirely, you know? And I kept thinking, oh, Oprah, go back to the girlfriend question. Come on. And she never did. <laughs> I, I'd love to go back and watch that again uh, with n- new eyesight. Now. now, what about people who yeah. say, well, Michael Jackson, Diane Diamond, you're so cynical. <laughs> what about Michael yeah. Jackson? He never had a childhood. He, and this, this is how he's acted out. But what about all his years at Studio 54 and all that? Well, but, you know, the honest truth is he never did have a childhood. And the childhood that he had was horrible. Mm. His father, I write about it in the book, his father, when he was a little kid, I mean like, oh, nine or ten, he scooped up those sons and he put them on the chitlin circuit in the nightclubs, the sleazy, slimy nightclubs, and had them perform so that they could get known and become famous. And who was the most talented? Michael. Michael was the wallet for that family. Yeah. Well, he's still the wallet for that family, even though he's dead, his estate. Uh, and, and so, he, you know, I agree. He didn't have a childhood. He had a terrible, terrible time growing up, lived with his family until he was in his 30s. And finally, again, I write this little incident in the book, he, uh, he decides that he's got to get out of their place in Havenhurst. They all live in this kind of mansion together. And he buys this ranch called Neverland, uh, you know, hour and a half north. And he doesn't tell anybody, and his parents find out why he hasn't been around lately. They think he's, uh, like, traveling or something. No, he's bought himself a ranch. They find out by watching Entertainment Tonight. <laughs> That's how they find out that Michael has finally cut the apron strings, and he goes up to this secluded ranch. And, of course, we know what he made of that. Mm. He made it a, a children's paradise. Hey, that reminds me of one thing. Um a lot of the detractors from leaving Neverland, uh, they say, well, uh, Jordy Ch- uh, 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 Robson. Robson can't be correct because he said he was uh, fondled, he was molested in the train station. And the train station wasn't built till after this period of time. Have you looked into that? I have. I have. Um, now, you, for people who aren't uh, quite following that, 
on the HBO documentary that came out earlier this year, Jimmy Safechuck, Wade Robson are talking about the years they were molested by Jackson. And Jimmy Safechuck makes the statement that I was molested all, all over Neverland. And I'm, I may not quote him exactly, but sure. like in the bedroom, in the theater, at the zoo, in the train station, blah, blah, blah. It went on until I was 14 years old. Well, after that documentary, now everybody's fact-checking it, and it turns out that the train station, this big thing with the upstairs room and the trestles and all of that, it wasn't completed until Safe Chuck was about 16. So it's like, oh, well, he must be lying about everything because that doesn't check out. Well, then you go back to the documentary and you see that there is a picture of Jimmy Safechuck at Neverland and with the train station and the big trestle building behind him. So he then, well, the producer of the documentary then made the correction that, you know what, the molestation went on longer than he admitted. It didn't end when he was 14. It ended when he was 16. Mm. So, you know, it, for me, that's a fine point. There are some molestation victims who remember everything, Ed. They remember the texture of the bedspread, the color of the walls, what the drapes looked like. They remember everything. And then there are some that can't tell you the date something happened. Well, when you're eight years old, do you remember the date? Do you remember that it was July 14th, uh, 2001? No, they don't remember every single little thing. It's a trauma to be molested. So did I make a lot of that? I thought it was interesting to point out that he may have been m not telling the truth on that. But in the scheme of things, I thought, eh, it doesn't really matter. It yeah, doesn't the, really matter. Yeah, part there was of the, a picture of him with that same building in the background, so obviously he was there. Yeah, part of the reaction to trauma is to forget. You know, to, and your body causes you to forget these uh, uh, traumatic sure. experiences. Uh, now, what about the people also talk about uh, Latoya Jackson? Oh, Ed, she's flip flop. Uh, at first, she said uh, she suspected him, but now she's changed her mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the Jackson family is such an interesting yeah. dynamic to watch. They have, since they're kids, learned how to spin things to the best uh, public relations way of looking at things. And so they all had it ingrained in them that this is how you present yourself. We need to be successful. This is how we make our money. Don't tell any of the dirty family secrets. Don't tell that the oldest daughter, Rebe, actually filed a police report against her own father for molesting her wow. way back in Gary, Indiana. Oh, sh nobody talk about that. So Latoya grows up and she marries a guy named Jack Gordon. And Jack Gordon was her manager and then she married him, much older than she was. And he gave her, he, told, he once told me, he said, you know what I did with LaToya? I gave her permission to tell the truth. So the allegations come out against her most famous brother, Michael. And she goes, I think it was on MTV and then the Daily Mail or something like that, a couple of interviews. And she said, these allegations are true. I have seen the big checks with a lot of zeros at the end of them that my brother has written to the family of these boys. We we need to keep him away from young boys. Blah, blah. And she just, what she said, she said she was telling the truth. Well, then her family comes down on her like a ton of bricks. And she comes back, oh, several weeks later and says, oh, yeah, Jack made me say that. It wasn't true. So <laughs> what do you make of that, Ed? Was she telling the truth in the beginning, or was she lying, or is she lying when she said Jack made her do it? I can't ask Jack because Jack's dead. Yeah, Jack's so. a fascinating character himself. Seems to be involved in a lot of uh, you know, pimping, I guess you'd call it, right? And uh, uh, massage parlors. He placed a bomb onto Harry Reid's car. <laughs> All his partners oh, turned yeah. up. <laughs> He's a fascinating He was quite a character. <laughs> He I was quite a character. How does he, a guy like that walk through the way? Hey, I want to write a book. I said, well, you, <laughs> good luck with that, Jack, because I'm not the one to help you with that, yeah. you know. But, but, but typical of the people that surround the Jackson family. He's not unusual. Well, it, you know, you hit the nail on the head. Yeah. When you look at the people that surrounded, say, Michael Jackson at the end, 
you know, in the beginning, he had some really good people around him. And then I believe as his addictions took over, drug, alcohol, cosmetic surgery, he started firing all the people who had served him well over the years, um, his PR guy, Bob Jones, his head of security, um, trying to think of his name right now. Oh, gosh, it'll come to me. Fired him outright. Uh, and he began to surround himself with people who just did him no good at all and were just in it for the money. So they could say, I work for Michael Jackson. If you want to talk to him, give, put $10,000 in my hand and I'll put you in the same room. You know, he he. When you look back, though, he just didn't have the capacity to make good decisions. Number one, because he was addicted to substances. But number two, and maybe more importantly, his father had made all the decisions for him over the years. You know, it was his dad who told him what to do forever. And Jackson was a pretty good, astute businessman when it came to buying music catalogs and, and you know, producing albums. But in the end, he just surrounded himself with really unhelpful people. It was sad. If you want people that are going to look the other way at what you're doing and not judge you, those are the kind of people you're going to find. Yeah, and you know... Every time I interviewed somebody, going back to the 93, yeah. maids, limo drivers, um, people who worked in his kitchen, wardrobe people, um, groundskeepers, and they would tell me these stories about him fondling little boys and French kids. You know, I was like, why didn't you go to the police? Did you ever tell law enforcement? And they all look at you and shrug their shoulders and say, who would believe me? You know, I'm just a maid. I just drive his car. He's Michael Jackson. They're not going to believe me. And besides, I need the job, <laughs> you know? So I, I, I want to blame the pedophile, but I also blame the people around him that didn't mm -hmm. stop him. And the lawyers who signed all these non-disclosure agreements with families so that Nobody ever really knew what the truth was, and more little boys came into his sphere. Yeah, and the private investigators running around doing payoffs, spying on people, harassing people. Which reminds me, too, Anthony Policano, uh, he, he had said, uh, I'm trying to get a lot of people's opinion on this. He had said that, uh, well, Michael Jackson's done things far worse than molesting little boys. Uh, and he said it again when he just got out of prison, right before he got out of prison. Uh, what do you make of that? What do you think it is? <sighs> I think it's molesting multiple children, and I think that Anthony Pelicano understood that in the end. That's why he stopped working for Jackson, because as the father, I think he has nine kids. Hmm. He understood, I don't want to even be associated with this. Now, do I know for sure? No, I don't. Yeah. Um, Anthony Pelicano, you know, he's straight out of Chicago. P.I. noir film. Uh, he's, you know, drives around with a baseball bat in his trunk, and he's, you know, the big P.I. to the stars, and he's never going to tell the truth, he says. Mm. But then he drops a bomb like that, and it made me sit up and realize he was harassing me. He had me under surveillance. He made my life miserable, but in the end, he got it. He understood, and he stopped working for Jackson. All right, let's take a break right there. We are with Diane Diamond. She's the author of the book, uh, Be Careful Who You Love. Uh, it just came out, an additional audio book just came out. just came out today, by the way, guys. Okay? We, we get the best here at the Opperman Report. <laughs> okay? We get them first, too, when we can. By the way, Diane, too, you got a podcast, too, right? Um, I do uh, occasional podcasts, various different ones. But the audio book um, is the only version of the book that has four new chapters in it. And I decided to write new chapters for various reasons, but mostly just to update the book. We can talk more about that on the other side. Okay, great. We'll be right back with more of uh, Diane Diamond, uh, dianediamond.com, after these messages. And now a word from our sponsors. AlmightyGold.com. Get your gold in affordable quantities. One gram, two and a half grams, five grams, no minimum purchase required. Why save in paper when you can save in gold? AlmightyGold.com understands it's difficult to afford gold in large quantities. No one can afford an ounce of gold. 
This is why Almighty Gold has introduced to you Carrot Bars, a most reliable company where you can buy gold in minor quantities from as little.